This lecture is part of an online math course on group theory and will be about free groups. So we'll start by quickly reviewing free abelian groups and then see how much of this theory extends to free, possibly non-abelian groups. So a free abelian group on various elements, A, B, C, and so on, is a sort of universal um, abelian group generated by um, these elements, A, B, C, and so on. So universal means it should be as big as possible. So we, we don't put on any unnecessary relations like insisting A should have order three and so on. And it's pretty obvious what the free abelian group on this is. If we've got elements A, B, C in an abelian group, then, then the group subgroup generated them consists of all elements of the form N1, A plus N2, B and so on, where the N, I are in Z. And the, the most universal way of doing that is just to take a sum of copies of the group Z. So this Z is going to be generated by A, this one by B, and so on. So the free abelian group on a finite set of generators is just a sum of copies of Z. Um, it has a universal property. So if, if F means the free abelian group on um, elements A, B, C, or whatever, then if we've got any group A, any abelian group A, and we've got certain elements A, uh, let's call them A, B, C, in this group A, then there's a unique homomorphism from the free abelian group, which takes the element A here to the, to the element A and there and so on. So the number of um, in, in particular, the rank of a free abelian group, which is the number of generators, is well defined. For instance, the free abelian group on two generators is not isomorphic to the free abelian group on three, three generators. And the easy way to see this is the number of homomorphisms from the free group on n generators to say z modulo 2z is just 2 to the n because each of the n generators can be mapped to one of the two elements here. So, so um, if you know, if you're given a free abelian group, you can determine its number of generators just by counting homomorphisms to z over 2z. That's if it's finitely generated. If it's infinitely generated, you get it to um, and subgroups of free abelian groups are easy to describe. So if we've got a subgroup of a free abelian group, which we will take to be z to the n, these subgroups are all free abelian of rank less than or equal to n. Moreover, we can choose a basis um, A1, A2, An, so the subgroup is of the form generated by N1, A1, N2, A2, and so on, where the Ni's are the negative integers. And the proof of this, just see the classification of finitely generated free um, finitely generated abelian groups. Because the way we classified finitely generated abelian groups was that we showed, implicitly showed they were the quotient of a free abelian group by a subgroup, and then showed that we could choose the subgroup in this form so that our finitely generated group is a sum of cyclic groups of orders n1, n2, and so on, or at least if the ni are finite. Um, finally, we'll just draw a quick picture of a free abelian group. So a free abelian group on, let's do two generators, might look something like this. So here we've got two generators, a red generator and a green generator. And the 
points of the um, free abelian group just form the the elements of a free abelian group just form the points of a lattice. So these black spots correspond to the points of the group and the red and the green arrows just tell you what happens if you multiply some element by one of the generators. And you can see you're just getting a square lattice or the obvious analog in higher dimensions. So that's free abelian groups. And we're now going to try and find analogs of all these for um, non-abelian groups. Um, so first of all, um, we'd better construct a free abelian group. Well, before constructing free abelian groups, let's first construct free monoids. So a monoid is like a group without inverses. So we just, it has an identity and a multiplication and it's associative and the identity is, um, behaves in the obvious way, but we don't assume there, there are inverses. And then there's an obvious way to construct a free monoid on A, B, C. This is going to be all words in A, B, C, and so on. And a word has the fairly obvious meaning. It's just formed by putting letters together. So the words are as follows. First of all, there's the empty word, where you put no elements at all. And we'll denote that by one, because if I denoted the empty word by, by writing nothing at all, you wouldn't be able to see it. And then we can have words. Um, let's do two generators. We'd have A, B, A, 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 B, B, A, B, B, and then A, 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 and so on. And it's pretty obvious that this gives you a sort of universal monoid. It has the universal property. If, if you've got the universal monoid F and any other monoid M, and you choose, say, two elements in M, there would be a unique homomorphism from the universal monoid on A and B to M that takes A to this element and B to that element and so on. So free monoids are easy to construct. Also, if you've got a monoid, we want to find quotient monoids. And this is a little bit tricky. You, you, you can't start using cosets of monoids because that's that sort of required the use of cosets. However, we can, fit, we, we can quotient out by an equivalence relation. So if you've got a monoid, suppose we want to identify some elements of the monoid. So we want to identify the element x with y, say. Then we form the smallest equivalence relation on M such that it contains whatever equivalences we want. We might have X, we might want to make X1 equal to Y1 and X2 equals to Y2. So we insist that Xi is equivalent to Yi. And then we want to say if A is equivalent to B, then CA is equivalent to CB, and AC is equivalent to um, BC. And if we form this equivalence relation, you can check that the equivalence classes also form a monoid and a multiplication. And this is a sort of quotient of M, it, it, but, but by forcing various elements of M to be equal. Um, and now you can form a free group We just take the free monoid on elements a, a to the minus one, b, b to the minus one, and so on, and quotient by, um, by forcing a, a to the minus one equals a to the minus one, a equals one, and same for b, c, and so on. So. This gives us a, 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 a free group, and um, you can check it has the universal property. If G is a group with elements A, B, C, and so on, we can map 
the free group on elements A, B, and C to G by mapping little a to big A, little b to big B, and so on. So it has the correct universal property. In particular, we can see the rank is well defined because the rank of a free group on n generators is given as follows. The number of homomorphisms from the free group on n generators to z over 2z is again just 2 to the power of the rank, just as it was for the abelian case. So the free group on two generators is not the same as the free group on three generators, for example. Um, so the problem is, how do we write out the um, elements of a, a free group? So let's try writing out the elements of the free monoid. We have 1, a, b, a to the minus 1, b to the minus 1. Then we get a squared, a, b, a. And then we get all sorts of things like a, b to the minus 1, a, a to the minus 1, and so on. And we notice that although in the free monoid, this would be an element, uh, 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 element not equal to 1. In the free group, this is equal to 1. And similarly, if you get more complicated elements, say a, a, b, b to the minus 1, a to the minus 1, b, a to the minus 1, we notice that we can simplify this element because b, b to the minus 1 is equal to 1, but then we can simplify it a bit further because we can cancel out the a and the a to the minus 1. Um, and if you think about it a bit, you'll see that every word is equivalent to a reduced word. where reduced means it does not contain x, x to the minus 1, or x to the minus 1, x for any of the generating elements. And now we have the following question. Um, if two reduced words are distinct, are they different? in the free group. And it sounds very plausible. And in fact, it's true, but we would like to prove it. And if you multiply one word by the inverse of the other, you see this is equivalent to the following question. If a reduced word is non-empty, is it not equal to 1 in the free group? Um, well, in order to do, in order to show that this is correct, we end up with the following problem. Given a reduced word in a a to the minus one b b to the minus one and so on, find a group with elements. A, A to the minus 1, B, B to the minus 1, and so on, so that this word is not equal to 1. Here I'm being a little bit careless. I'm using these elements A and B for, for elements of the group G, and I'm also using them for the basis elements of the free group. But since you're mapping the elements of the free group to these elements of G, it won't cause too much harm if we just use the same letter for both. And if you can do this, that will show that any um, um, non-empty reduced word is not the identity in the free group because it maps to a non-trivial element in this group, G. And we can do this as follows. In fact, if the word has length n, we can take g to be the symmetric group on n plus 1 letters. So this is the symmetric group. And the best way to prove this is just to do an example. So suppose I've got a word a squared b, a to the minus 1, b, a, b, a squared, b to the minus 3. 
And I want to ask you, can you find a group with elements A and B such that this element is not equal to one? So this is a reduced word. And, you know, it's, if you're given this, it's not at all obvious how you write down a group such that this, an explicit group such that this word is obviously not equal to one unless you kind of cheat by using the free group. Well, you can do this as follows. So this is a word of length 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. So I'm going to write down 13 points. And then I'm going to let A act like this because I've got an A squared. And then B is going to act like this. And then A is going to act like this. So this is going to be A to the minus 1. And then B is going to act here. So the green is going to be B and the red is going to be A. So here's A and we've got a, another B. I should have chosen a shorter word. This is getting a bit boring. Then we've got an A squared and then we've got a B to the minus three, which means. Um, so, so if the elements A and B act like this, then, then I've indeed found um, an element of the symmetric group on 13 points, such that this element is non-trivial because it maps that point to that point. Well, the trouble is these red and green things are not actually um, permutations yet. Um, however, I can turn them into permutations just by um, completing a cycle. So I'm going to um, I'm going to let A be the following permutation. I can let it do that, and then I could um, maybe let it do that and that and I could complete it like that and then I could just let it fix these points here. And I can do exactly the same thing for B. So I can let B fix these points and map that point back to there and map that point to there and map that point to there and map these points like this. So here I've written down two permutations a permutation A and a permutation B, such that this permutation is not the identity. And let's just think about why it's possible to do that. So what we're doing is we're, we're taking a few points and we've got a partial permutation um, and we want to know, can we complete it to a, a, a permutation? Well, there are two cases when you couldn't do that. So first of all, if, if I had um, a partial permutation that did this, then I couldn't complete it because the action on this point wouldn't be defined. There would be two point, I mean, there would be two things that I was trying to map this point to. Um, similarly, if I had it this way around, that would be impossible because there'd be two points trying to map to that. So that couldn't be a bijection. Well, if you look at this, this would correspond to a permutation X x to the minus one and, and this will correspond to x x to the minus one so so um these would only arise if you start with a with, with a non-reduced word you see if i started with a a non-reduced word here say um if, if if i did um a b b to the minus one a and tried to do this construction, then I would run into a problem because um, A would be trying to do this, which would be fine, but B would be trying to do this. And I couldn't complete B to a permutation, so the, the proof would break down for this. So that's where we use the fact that words are reduced. We want to be able to extend permutations to the whole set. So um, I think that construction makes it obvious that any non-reduced word in the free group is indeed not the identity. Um, well, we've actually proved a bit more than that. We've proved free groups are residually finite. So what does this mean? Well, a group G is residually finite means that for any element g not equal to 1, we can find a homomorphism from the group 
to a finite group G. So G has image not equal to one. And that's exactly what we did for the symmetric group where we took this finite group to be a, to be a symmetric group on, on one more Gener one more elements than the, than the length of G. Um, in case you're wondering if there are any groups that aren't residually finite, um, you notice the rational numbers under addition is not residually finite. Um, similarly, the real numbers under addition is not residually finite. And any infinite simple group is also not residually finite, which is kind of obvious because if it's an infinite simple group, it doesn't have any non-trivial homomorphisms onto finite groups. So um, infinite groups, are, most infinite groups you come across are in fact not residually finite. So th th this is actually quite, a, quite an unusual property. Um, by the way, it's tempting to define the free group. Um, so why not define the free group to be a set of reduced words. Well, you can. The problem is um, defining the product is a bit tricky because you then have to say you take the union of two reduced words and cancel out anything that matches. And proving associativity of this um, product is kind of tricky. Because the problem is you may get things like this. You might have a word A, B, A, and then you might have a word A to minus one, B to the minus one. Um, and then you might have a, another word A, 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 B. And if you multiply these two, then the A's cancel out and the B's cancel out. Um, and if you multiply these two, then nothing cancels out. And you've then, it's, it's, it's really quite a tricky combinatorial problem to show that um, the product defined by taking reduced words and multiplying by canceling things out is associative. It's, you, you have to look at a large number of slightly tricky cases. So it's possible to do this, but it's, it's the sort of argument where it's really easy to make mistakes. So I think it's better to define the free group in a way that makes it obviously exist and then prove that it consists of the reduced words. Um, I'll just finish by trying to draw a picture of the free group on two generators. So we had a picture of the free abelian group on two generators. And the free group on two generators is kind of looks a bit like this. So first of all, I'm going to take the point here, and I can map the first generator. So, so, so I'm going to take this point to be the identity, and then we have the first generator can act on it. And the second generator can act on it like this. So I get some more points where the second generator um, does something. And now I want to apply the first generator to things that the second generator um, moved. And I can do it sort of like this. And I've got to leave a lot of room, oops, because I need to leave room for the second generator to act on all these points. So the second generator is going to act like this. Um, and there are going to be lots more points here. and so on. And now I need to act on with the first generator again. So the second generator on these points here, and I have to have these going through all these points and through all these points. And what you notice is that I'm really running out of room. Um, and if I did one or two more iterations, I just wouldn't have room to draw these things anymore because the trouble is um, 
free groups on more than one generator sort of exponentially increasing. You can see the number of words of length n on the generators increases as an exponential function of n. So uh, as soon as I get to words of length more than about three or four, I simply don't have room to draw them on a Euclidean piece of paper. So the free abelian group was OK because the number of words just increases like a polynomial. So you can draw them in Euclidean space, which is plenty of room for polynomially growing functions. But you can't really draw free groups in Euclidean space. What we should really do is draw them in a hyperbolic space. Because hyperbolic space has an exponentially increasing amount of room if you um, um, put some sort of, uh, uh, as you go further away from the origin. So you can draw free, free non-abelian groups very nicely in hyperbolic space. In some sense, free abelian group, groups live in Euclidean space and free non-abelian groups live in hyperbolic space. Well, there's one final question. Um, so for free abelian groups, I said that any subgroup of a free abelian was a free abelian group of rank most equal to the group you started with. And you ask if there's an analog of this for non-abelian free groups. And that's almost true. First of all, any subgroup of a free abelian group is free abelian. However, the rank might increase. So um, you may think the free abelian group on three generators is bigger than the free abelian group on two generators, but you're wrong because the free abelian group on three generators is actually a subgroup of the free abelian group on two generators. And next lecture, we will explain this rather bizarre sounding result. <laughs>